Good morning and welcome to this uh, online pre-recorded worship uh, for our services uh, for August the 7th. Sunday, August the 7th will be at Central and at Stanhope uh, on that Sunday. And um, I'm glad you can join us online at least. Uh, just a few announcements before we uh, begin. Uh, next Sunday, the 14th, uh, will be our uh, West Coast Head St. James uh, annual picnic service uh, that will start at 10 a.m. and will include uh, communion. It's uh, potluck, uh, so you can bring food along with you. I, I did call the Environmental Health Department just to check on whatever COVID regulations might be in place, and um, we're okay to uh, do as we usually do as long as we're not advertising it as a, a public event. So it's a it's a church event, so we're fine. Um, I think we also have to put up a, a sign um, saying that uh, the food has been not been prepared in um, a, a large professional uh, kitchen, just to note that it comes from people's homes, which we're fine with, I'm sure. Um, so I look forward to seeing you there uh, next week. Uh, that means that the following week, the services would uh, flip back to Central and Stanhope and then so on through the, uh, through the schedule as we go forward. Um, I think those are the uh, um, key announcements. Oh, we do have copies of the annual report of the churches now. And uh, also, fund script orders will be taken on uh, Sunday. So if you have a fund script order, you're not in church, just send Margaret an email and we'll get that sorted out for you. Those are our announcements. Uh, so glad you can join us for worship. And as always, we light our Christ candle to signify the presence of Jesus in our midst, whether we are in person or online. We may find ourselves in the deepest and the darkest places at times, when it seems there's no hope, no light at the end of the tunnel, but the light of Christ is always there with us. So it's good to remember that. Amen. now our call to worship. We are a people who have been called to follow where God leads us. And by faith, we can obey even when asked to walk into an unknown future. We are people who have been challenged to tell God's story to others. And by faith, we have the ability to share the good news. We are God's children who are invited to feast at the table of grace. And by faith, we will embrace our sisters and brothers in Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have two scripture readings today. They're both related and tied together in the message. Uh, the first is from Genesis 15 and is the uh, part of the story of Abraham 15, 1 to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Elysia of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring. And so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, no one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Thanks be to God for the reading of the Hebrew Bible. And our second reading is from the uh, a letter of Paul to the Hebrews. Well, we don't know for sure that Paul wrote it, but uh, the author is writing to um, a Christian community uh, of uh, Jewish Christians. Uh, so it's a letter to the Hebrews. 
You're probably familiar with this one as well. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed on for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to a city that has no foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one person, and this one as good as dead, Abraham, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had the opportunity to return, but as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Thanks be to God for the reading of the word. Amen. There's a story told about a man named Sven who was an immigrant from Sweden. And Sven had to find work in his new country. And he landed a job painting stripes down the center of the highways. This is before there were machines to do this kind of thing. So Sven went to work his first day and ended up painting two miles of an almost perfectly straight line down the center of the highway. And Sven's boss was very pleased, for no one had ever done uh, before this uh, painting two miles of center stripe in one day. So the next day, Sven painted one mile of center stripe, which is still very good, and his boss was well satisfied. But then the next day, Sven only painted half a mile of stripe. And on the fourth day, he painted just a quarter mile. Finally, the boss decided he'd need to have a talk with Sven because he was no longer satisfied with his work. So the boss said to Sven, Sven, you painted two miles on your first day. Now you're down to a quarter of a mile. What happened? Sven answered, Well, you see, each day my bucket get further and further away. It sometimes feels that God or our faith in God is getting further and further away from us. But then is it God who has moved away from us or are we moving away from God? In our text from the letter to the Hebrews, Paul is writing to a community whose original faith, the bucket where all their hopes and dreams once were, is getting further and further away from their present reality. And Paul was writing to a community of Jewish Christians, Jews who had decided to follow Jesus. They had moved away from the practices of their former faith, but were now entering unknown territory. And life was difficult for them. The community had suffered great hardship, particularly from the Romans, including things like public ridicule, confiscation of goods and property, uh, imprisonment and worse. And because of the pressure put on their community, some had left the faith. Others avoided worship altogether, and still others were weary and disheartened by the delay in the coming of the Lord that would confirm their belief. This is a belief that came at great cost. The Romans had destroyed the temple, which had once been the center of their belief in God, so there was no going back to the lives they had before as Jews. 
Jesus was their temple now and their high priest, and he was to return and gather them up together. And like Moses, he would lead them into God's kingdom, but he wasn't there yet, at least not in any tangible way. These Jewish Christians, they lived in a, a Greco-Roman society, it's called, and they spoke and understood the Greek language. In fact, Paul is writing to them, as we know, in Greek. And the Greek word he uses for faith is a word called pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. -I -I and pistis was also the Greek goddess of faith and honesty and trust. And when the legendary Pandora's box, which we will have heard about, when it was open, Pistis was one of the spirits who um, escaped and fled to heaven. So when Jesus says in Luke's gospel, will the Son of Man find faith on earth, he's speaking to a Greek culture that believed the spirit of faith had already le left. The Jewish Christians um, that Paul was writing to must have also felt that Pistis faith um, had left the building, as they say. So Paul in this text and the verses before the ones I read, he gives them uh, like a litany about faith, which the patriarchs had lived by. That by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. And by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, Noah, when warned, built an ark to save his family. And Paul then moves on to Abraham as a model of faith. By faith, Abraham, when called, obeyed God and left his home in Mesopotamia. By faith, he made his home in the Promised Land like a stranger in a foreign country. But one author has suggested that at this particular point in his life, Abraham was certainly a man of good values. He tried to uh, follow God to the best of his ability, but he was not yet fully a man of faith particularly when at this point in his advancing years, the hope of having children and an heir was pretty remote. Abraham had followed God all of his life, but now the future looked pretty grim and bleak. The fact that God says to Abraham, do not be afraid in this text, means that Abraham was indeed afraid. And what was he afraid of? He was afraid that his family line after him would not continue, that this whole venture to leave his home in Ur, in Mesopotamia, and to wander into the wilderness had been just a futile project, and it would all come to nothing. Abraham says to God, what can you give me since I remain childless? You will give me no children, so a servant in my household will end up being my heir. And not having children to follow you meant death in this society. Not having a child with Sarah meant the end of Abraham's line. I remember I quoted uh, Kafka last week who said the meaning of life is that it ends. Well, Abraham was afraid his life would end without meaning and without fulfillment of God's promise. So I can imagine at this stage in his life, Abraham was asking himself the question, why me? Why me? Maybe Abraham was in that place between faith and frustration. There was originally this promise, but it hadn't happened yet, and it didn't look like it would ever happen. Uh, we sometimes find ourselves in the same spot where we ask, why me? And what happened to the promise? And we do this as individuals, and we do it as communities. Think back 20 or 30 years ago in this church or any church you're associated with. What was it like then? I imagine there were certainly a lot more people and there were many children and young people, uh, more money, a vibrant Sunday school. But now you might be wondering at times, like Abraham, um, what is it, what is to be our legacy going forward? Do you ever find yourself like Abraham asking God, what happened? To that promise, Lord? Do you find yourself like uh, the character Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof who asks, Why me, God? I know, I know we are your chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose somebody else? 
Well, it's, it's good to ask these hard questions of, uh, to God. It is part of the journey of faith, and the questions mean that we actually have uh, a grounded relationship with God. But notice what happens in this story from Genesis, uh, the story about Abraham. The Lord says to him, come, Abraham, come with me. Let's go for a little walk. I want you to look up into that night sky. Look at those stars overhead. How many do you think there are? Thousand, a million, a billion, more? You may never see it yourself, Abraham, but the future of your people is in those stars. Well, you know, I remember the first time I looked at the night sky with a decent set of binoculars. And the stars that leapt into view, it was just astonishing. And there in the northern hemisphere, I could see the great wheel of the Andromeda galaxy. And it just blew me away. This wonderful, complex universe that we're a part of. And, and this God who brought it and us into being. And my fears and problems seemed so much less threatening in that moment and I think that's probably what happened to Abraham when he looked into the night sky his frustration was transformed into faith his key question changed from why me to okay God what's next you see why me implies you know why are we on this journey what is the point of all this wandering but the question, what next, God, recognizes that faith is more about the journey than the arrival. And we don't need to worry so much about what the destination is. All we need to be concerned about is what's the next step, trusting that God will be alongside us from our beginning to our end. What's next? We can learn here from the First Nations people. They take a longer view. Uh, of things that uh, positive change can take seven generations to bring about sustainable change at least our outgoing moderator Reverend Richard Bott says let's stop obsessing about the United Church's demise his thinking is also along these lines of what's the next step I met a patient in hospital in 2018 when I was doing my clinical pastoral education course and she knew the difference between why me and what's next type of thinking she'd been at the victoria general for several months on our ward and i was a hospital chaplain in her room and she had been very sick uh, in fact on three occasions i believe it was she nearly died and she told me that in her younger days in her 20s she used to be a stock car race driver but now she couldn't even walk. And I could see that she still had some health challenges ahead of her. She was on a waiting list for a place in a care facility because she was disabled and not able to care for herself. But she just epitomized those qualities of faith which Abraham found when he looked up at the stars. She understood her health challenges. She knew that she had to live with her condition for the rest of her life, but she also had the imagination to see her future life in the care home. And furthermore, she was excited to be part of this, this community that she was going to. And she was hoping that there was a choir and she could sing with them. Well, one day when I was visiting with her, she told me that she'd woken up in the early hours of the morning. And she said that there was a beautiful woman standing at the foot of her bed looking at her and telling her that everything was going to be all right. And she said, you know, I'm not a person who even goes to church, and I'm not interested in going either. But that morning, when I saw that woman, I knew I had seen my guardian angel. There's something out there, she said, who we call God, a presence who is there for us, who is looking after us. Like it says in the hymn, she continued, there must be a God somewhere. And she said, realizing that our connection to that presence, God, 
means that we should never try to hide from our problems or even push against them or try to make them go away. But knowing that God is indeed with us, we just find another way forward. On my last day on the ward, she just received her motorized wheelchair, which meant she could now go out of the hospital into the sunshine for the day, down the street to the park. And she said to me, grinning, watch out Halifax, because here I come. Then she looked right at me and she said, never be afraid of taking the next step in your life, which was a meaningful moment for me because my next step essentially to Margaret and I was coming here to PEI. Like Abraham, we are tent dwellers. We are people on a journey, traveling through a wilderness, never having a permanent home, but always looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. The whole point of our gathering as a church is to realize that we're part of a, a great tribe, helping each other to live into our journey, a tribe that stretches behind us and in front of us, a tribe whose center of gravity is not our expectations, not our fears, but faith, the assurance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things unseen. So the next time you're outside at night and it's a clear sky, have a look up at those stars. Our hope lies in them. Amen. Now let us lift up our hearts and our minds in prayer. O Holy One, we thank you that we stand in a long line of believers who have been faithful through the ages. You have been leading your people through trial and difficulty, and you have always set foot before them in hope for today and hope for a better tomorrow. We pray that you would bless us in our time as we seek to be as faithful as our forebearers. May we too know the faith which is filled with hope in things not seen. Give to us a faith like the grain of mustard seed, which had small beginnings, but which yielded large results. Give to us the faith to move the mountains of difficulty, which come to each one of us. Give to us the faith that sees a distant goal and is willing to work to achieve it. Give to us a faith that has vision of a new world where peace and love characterize the transactions of people and of nations and where war is no more. Give to us a faith such as Abraham's to move forward, not knowing our destination, but trusting in your guiding providence. Give to us a faith which is able to endure those moments of personal disquiet and to trust that you are indeed with us. Give to us a faith which sees the welfare of humankind as our business because it is the focus of your enduring love for your people. Give to us a faith which sees beyond the years to an eternal city. God, give us faith to walk with you through the ebb and flow and the victories and the defeats of life and to achieve victory and mastery of life. Living God, reach out to all those for whom the future brings fears and uncertainties. Assure them that you are with them. Even when the future seems dark and circumstances feel they are spiraling out of control. Remind them that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations, bringing healing and wholeness. And use us as your church, as instruments of hope in their lives. Lord, we make our prayers in faith, for we know that your spirit is at work in our world, making all things new. Amen. And now we are sent out into the world. By faith, let us go out as God's people. We will gather others around us and we will dance into God's kingdom. By faith, let us go to follow Jesus, to serve with compassion and grace. We will share the good news of hope and peace with everyone we meet. By faith, let us go to join the Holy Spirit in welcoming all of God's children. We will add as many chairs as are needed so all may feast on God's love. Thanks be to God. Amen. And have a wonderful day and enjoy the sunshine we are having at the moment. See you next time.